now call to order the regular meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. It's January 10th, 2023. Happy New Year. And it is 9 a.m. Clerk, will you please call the roll? Supervisor Friend? Here. Cummings? Fernandez? Here. McPherson? Here. And Koenig? Here. Thank you, Trade of Quorum. Thank you. Begin with a moment of silence, followed by a Pledge of Allegiance. And the Supervisor Friend had some comments to make. Thank you. First, I'd like to just acknowledge all those that have been impacted by these storms. We have a lot of displaced residents, a lot of emotional and physical challenges going on right now. Um, we should definitely dedicate our thoughts to that. I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge the passing of Marilyn Whittacote, who had served on this board in uh, the second district. She was actually the second female lawyer in Santa Cruz County and sang professionally with the Zurich Opera. Well, she only served one term and it was a pretty difficult and challenging time on the board at that time. And there was a lot of division. Um, I enjoyed every year we'd get together for coffee or lunch. And I just enjoyed hearing about the history of when she served and um, she passed just a couple of weeks ago. So if we could keep her in our thoughts, I'd appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, we'll have a moment of silence. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with the liberty and justice for all. CEO Palacios, do we have any additions or deletions to the agenda today? Uh, we have no corrections to, to the agenda today. Thank you. Does any board member wish to remove an item from the consent agenda to the regular agenda? Seeing none, we'll proceed with public comment. Any person may now address the board. Speakers must not exceed two minutes in length. And individuals may speak on items listed on today's consent agenda, closed session agenda, regular agenda, or yet to be heard on the regular agenda, or a topic not on the agenda that is within the jurisdiction of the board. Board members will not take actions or respond immediately to any public communication presented on topics not on the agenda, but may choose to follow up later. Please proceed. Good morning. My name is James. It's January 10th, 2023. I'm addressing the full house of the Board of Supervisors, all males. That's great. It's going to be much easier in the future to communicate with you men directly. Um, you know, don't believe a word I say. Do your own research. There's a lot of stuff going on that's really incredibly beguiling. Um, there's an American state national, Mr. David Strait. He was told that uh, at one time he had more open lawsuits in the United States than any other individual. He's not a lawyer. That's pretty much the biggest criminal class on the planet. Um, I don't know. I don't think it would be that difficult to figure out a way to uh, exceed that by a factor of 10 just in this county. So um, what's really changed? What's really going on? Um, this country is run by the RAND Corporation and the Department of Defense. And we've had a lot of countermeasures that have been delivered to not just the people that live in the United States, but all over, but all over the world. So it seems really sad that the Department of Defense is having a war upon its own citizens in the world. So it's just nice to be here. Nice to see all of you. And congratulations to the two new men in the room. That's great. Thank you, Mr. Whitman. Anyone else here in the public? All right, seeing none, is there anyone on Zoom that wishes to address us? Yes, Chair, we do have one speaker online. Call in user ending in 2915. Your microphone is now available. Good morning. This is Becky Steinbruner. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good morning. And I'm, um, I can't see you, uh, but I'm happy that the board is meeting in person this morning and um, want to comment on consent agenda item number 4040. I um, am opposed to the county parks donating 
$50,000 to a study to look at trails for our county. Um, parks always says they don't have money to take care of our parks. Um, in fact, they've instituted a commemorative program where they charge people to rededicate benches, and it's a lot of money, um, $1,300 for a bench after 10 years you have to pay to keep the the memorial plaque on it in the memory of the person that you you loved i don't think that donating fifty thousand dollars to a study to look at trails in the county is a wise use of our county parks money um, i think you could probably get as good of information from the public who uses the trails um, and those who live near them so please do not approve item number 40, or at least ask how this is really going to benefit the people. Um, I want to also speak on item 44, the crosswalk improvements. Please keep in mind those who are blind, low vision, and have mobility challenges in these crosswalk upgrades. I've become aware of the needs of the blind through the uh, Lions Club affiliation. It is a different world for them and what makes sense to sighted people does not work at all for those who cannot see. And a huge uh, problem has is visible at the intersection. Thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. Call in user one, your microphone is now available. Greetings to our new two Board of Supervisors members, Felipe and Justin. I've spoken many times before you at your city council meetings and provided you with documentation on microwave radiation harm from exposure to cell phones, antennas, cell towers, cell towers, I call them murder towers, everywhere, including in the public right of way on Freedom Boulevard in Aptos, where I reside. No neighbor has consented to this violation of our health and property rights and constitutional rights. As our county is partnering with Cruz IO, providing them with a half million dollars to install these hazardous 5G radiation assault antennas and towers throughout our county, I now again implore you to halt this 5G onslaught by Cruz IO and the telecom corporations. And I recommend you read a book by Dr. Thomas Cowan and uh, called The Contagion Myth, Why Viruses, Including Coronavirus, Are Not the Cause of Disease by Dr. Thomas Cowan. And I'm looking at the chapter on electricity and disease, electricity and disease. And um, it refers you, to Garrett. 5G hazards. Thank you. We have no further speakers, Chair. All right, then I'll return it to the board for action on the consent agenda. Does any member of the board wish to comment? Supervisor Friend? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have brief comments on two items. Item 43, which in, which deals with the Westridge Drive project. Again, this investment in South County is, is unprecedented and completely needed. And as we see even today with the potential of the Paparo River flooding, just the need to continue to have services in the South County. It's absolutely important. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Supervisor Hernandez here. And this is a big part of his district and his constituency to make sure that we provide these services to South County. On item 44, I'd like to appreciate uh, Mr. Wiesner, who's here from Public Works, he's worked very hard with our office and other offices up here to ensure that we can bring forward these crosswalk improvements. Uh, these are in very, uh, currently, uh, very difficult to see locations and, and these kinds of high profile improvements will really improve the pedestrian safety in these areas. These, once they're put in, 
Um, I think it'll significantly improve, especially in my district and, and in the area that I share with Supervisor Hernandez in South County on Green Valley. Uh, these are highly used areas by pedestrians, but they're actually uh, poor visibility areas. And so improving these areas as Mr. Wiesner's leading uh, will make a big difference. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. Supervisor uh, McPherson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to comment on three items on the consent agenda. Um, First of all, now I remember uh, 19, the FEMA claims. I want to thank for the, for the update on the FEMA process. But I, I have to say that we should all really be concerned of this long process taken, um, how it's taken, how long it's taken to get our claims uh, evaluated, appeal, the appeals evaluated. Uh, there's $70 million in expenses um, on appeal or in the pipeline that represents a large part of our operating budget. It puts a real crimp on our planning for the budget for this next fiscal year. And as I will mention our regular agenda day, it especially concerns me how long it takes to receive FEMA support for damages that we have received in the last 10 days. Uh, we're not getting some things back yet for the that are years old. Um, counties really can't shoulder the uh, burden of emergency response on their own for the extended periods of time. And I, I really especially want to thank a supervisor friend and his staff for working diligently to unlock some of those funds uh, for our county. He's been very effective with the National Association of Counties, NACO, and I really appreciate his efforts. On item uh, number 20, the statement of the vote of, of the election that we just had, uh, just a couple of statistics uh, that I think would be of an interest to our county residents. Uh, the turnout in Santa Cruz County was 63.5%. Uh, we all would like to be at 100 but that's much better than the California percentage overall of 51%. So congratulations to the voters who turned out. I wish those other third or more would do the, the same thing uh, the next election cycle. Um, and secondly, uh, of the 104,000 votes cast, um, the 96,000 were cast by mail. Um, that is really an amazing uh, statistic. And I, uh, we have over 90% of the people voting by mail. Uh, and I especially want to thank our county clerk, Tricia Weber, and everybody in her office for the elections process that she established and followed through on. And uh, we didn't have any, any issues here on the election results. And uh, that's good to hear. But um, I want to congratulate those 63.5% of people who voted. I, I really urge you, uh, the other third, to turn out next time in two years. Um, on item number 32, uh, Zone Haven, um, months before the CZU fire, then uh, CAL FIRE Chief Ian Larkin and I co-hosted a series of meetings for the county staff to, uh, staff to learn about Zone Haven and the next generation of vegetation mapping in the county. Um, it was our proactive attempt to better be, uh, be better prepared for the next uh, fire season. But when the CZU uh, fire broke out, our county was still in the process of considering Zone Haven, so we weren't officially using uh, using it. But Chief Larkin was able to talk uh, Zone Haven into using its platform to facilitate evacuations during the CZU. Uh, and therefore, what's really important, um, we were able to evacuate more than 40,000 residents without a panic in that situation, uh, without incident or injury. And uh, likewise, it's been an important tool in the last couple of weeks that we've issued evacuation warnings uh, and orders for parts of our county related to the flood and debris flow concerns. I'm really happy to see that this contract is moving forward and it's one of the most critical investments we can make to address our emergency response uh, tools, uh, have our, and our tool shed uh, for the emergency responses that we're, we're witnessing today. So um, Zone Haven is very important. It tells us where some of the most uh, susceptible areas are and how we can respond to them as quickly as possible. Uh, and I want to thank, uh, going back to the CZU fire and today, uh, the evacuation orders that were put in place a couple of years ago in the fires, not one, there wasn't one fender bender. The, the, the activity of our emergency responders, uh, the sheriff and fire departments in particular, um, it was just phenomenal. And I just want to thank them again for what we're going through today and then what, for what they did a couple of years ago as well. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Supervisor Cummings. Uh, oh. Supervisor, if you could just press the gray button on the bottom of your microphone. Thank you. Can you hear me now? 
I just wanted to follow up on Supervisor McPherson's comments about Zone Haven. Um, one of the things that we had also heard about that is that now that we've had some experience using Zone Haven with the fires and now with the recent rains, um, members of the public, at least one in particular, reached out and just encouraged us to also follow up with the residents who've been using this technology to understand how their experience has been so that as we're continuing to use this and improve that technology over time, we're taking into account people's experience with using it. And so look forward to seeing how this develops so we can continue to help residents and communicate effectively with them during times of disaster. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Cummings. Supervisor Hernandez. You know, I also want to follow up on on the West Ridge project. You know, I think that in addition, I think it it makes sure that we uh, have less vehicle miles traveled when people can work in Watsonville and don't have to travel to Santa Cruz. So I'm really excited about the project that we're investing in South County and providing services, uh, but also you know a, that we're providing a place that we can live and work in the same location as well as traveling to Santa Cruz. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Hernandez. Uh, just a few comments. Um, first of all, I want to um, echo the thanks to Supervisor Friend for his leadership working with uh, the White House and federal partners to speed up the reimbursement of some of those FEMA funds. Um, you know, I think it's important to note that, especially as we're here in the middle of another disaster, FEMA is an aid, uh, but only reimburses 75% at best. Um, and as this item points out, we are still trying to get reimbursed for both the CZU fires and the uh, COVID shelters in particular. And in fact, we're paying uh, one to $2 million per year in interest right now just to cover some of those expenses. So hopefully our federal partners will be a little bit faster uh, in uh, reimbursing us for those past disasters and helping us with the the present one. But I'm 26. I also want to thank uh, Jennifer Martin for volunteering to serve on the Women's Commission. She has an impressive career in cybersecurity, and this will enable her to connect with uh, county, our county with federal grant opportunities for career training that will empower women, women with good paying jobs. On item 27, I want to thank Tracy Weiss for volunteering to serve on the Commission on the Environment. Her day job as executive director with the O'Neill Sea Odyssey means she'll bring many connections to schools to this position, which will help us broaden our outreach for county programs related to climate and the environment. I'm also looking forward to her work uh, with the Office of Response, Recovery, and Resilience on carbon sequestration of uh, potential for natural lands, particularly ocean and wetlands. And finally, on item 40, which uh, is to engage in a, in a a regional contract to study trail opportunities. I'm actually very excited about this project. Uh, we hear consistently that trails are one of the most valued uh, public resources. Uh, there was a study as part of the sustainability update that showed that people uh, prefer to trail more than anything else, even the grocery store being within a 15 minute walk of their home. And, and so this look at uh, new opportunities for regional connections for trails will be great. I think for our community, um, and I hope that we can also undertake a countywide trails master plan so that we really drill down, particularly on our own parks uh, and more opportunities for trails. Those are all my comments. Is there a motion on the consent agenda? I'd like to move the consent agenda, Chair. Motion by Supervisor Hernandez, second by Supervisor Cummings. Any further discussion? Seeing none, uh, and just a point of order here, I assume we no longer need to have a roll call vote since we're all in person. We're holding a hybrid teleconference meeting uh, right okay. now, so I would recommend that you continue to hold roll call votes, even though the five of you are present for this meeting. All right, then, Thank clerk, you. roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Cummings? Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. Consent agenda passes unanimously. Thank you. We will now proceed with item seven, which is to consider selection of chairperson and vice chairperson for calendar year 2023. It is this board's custom to rotate the chair and vice chair positions uh, from year to year so that every district has an opportunity uh, to undertake the responsibilities of chair and um, chair power equally. Uh, it was a great honor to serve as chair of this board for the last year. Uh, one of the jobs of chair, of course, is also to work with our board office analyst, uh, Caitlin Smith in this case, and uh, the rest of the, the board office. And uh, it was my honor to work with her to implement a new software platform that will better help us track constituent itch issues and manage communications uh, with constituents. So I um, hope that a new supervisor setting up their office will take advantage of that. I'm happy to um, dive into it further. Um, 
And it's also my great honor to nominate Supervisor Friend for chair and uh, Supervisor Justin Cummings for vice chair. Any further discussion or Mr. comments? Chair, yeah. Yes, Mr. Chair, if I may, I, I just wanted to uh, spend a second actually acknowledging your work over the last year. I think you did an outstanding job as chair, both managing efficient meetings and really providing an opportunity for the community uh, to participate, especially in the hybrid way that we did it with uh, a lot of respect and a lot of dignity. I thought you did an outstanding job as chair and I just wanted to acknowledge your work this year. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. Second that as well, as well as second motion, I think that was made. Uh, I don't believe we have an official motion, but if you oh. go ahead, friendly chair. Supervisor McPherson, if you could please press the gray button on your microphone. Excuse me. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, should should know by now. Okay. I'd like to nominate uh, Supervisor Friend to be chair for the 2023-4 uh, session of the Board of Supervisors and Justin Cummings to be the vice chair. Motion by Supervisor McPherson. And I'll second the motion. Second by Supervisor Hernandez. Any further discussion? Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, any public comment on this item? Well, my public comments is James Ewing Whitman as Zach Friend had a really crappy physical presence here last year. I don't know why he's wearing a mask. Um, but maybe he'll have more of a physical apprentice, a presence this year. Seeing no one else here in chambers, is there anyone online? Yes, we do have a speaker online. Call in user ending in 2915. Your microphone is now available. Hello, this is Becky Steinbruner. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, I know that this is pretty much an automatic um, rotation that occurs and and i applaud that it does rotate through the different districts and i do hope that supervisor friend will be present in physically present in the board chambers for the meetings as being chairman i would also like to request that this board reinstitute a three-minute public comment time you know the city of watsonville the council members and and uh Supervisor Hernandez, you're aware of this. They give equal time to themselves as what they give the public. They hold themselves to the, the time limits. And I suggest that that is a very fair uh, time and respectful thing to do. So please, at the very least, reinstitute a three minute public comment time especially in the open public time when we are given a vast opportunity to comment on a number of things on the agenda, consent agenda, closed closed session, and anything not on the agenda. Two minutes is really not enough. Thank you very much and a welcome to the chairmanship of the board and it's a pleasure that all of you are there today. Thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. Call in user one, your microphone is now available. This is Marilyn Garrett, and I agree with Becky Steinbrunner. I call for you uh, to reinstate the three minute comment period and also restore the right of the public to speak on consent agenda items like we used to, instead of just having what appears to be an elite board of supervisors comments. Um, also, I have to say, I feel very poorly represented by my supervisor, Zach Friend, and am outraged that he led the uh, move to put in Verizon 4G antennas all over uh, in this Freedom Day Valley McDonald area, 13 in a square mile, pulsing radiation constantly and interfering with our health 
This radiation also caused the death of birds and bees. You can check out cellphonetaskforce.org for much documentation. Public health and the well-being of the community is the reason you are there. It's Ms. Garrett, I, I would remind you that, in fact, um, we actually don't have the ability to regulate cell phone facilities on the basis of public health and safety. Um, and so really, your, like your comments your are job, probably yeah. better directed to our state uh, representatives. Directed all you need to speak out for our well-being. Thank you, Ms. So Garrett. We have no further speakers, Chair. All right, then I'll return to the board for deliberation and action. We had a motion by Supervisor McFriend, uh, sorry, McPherson, um, nominating Supervisor Friend as chair and uh, Supervisor Justin Cummings as vice chair, second by uh, Supervisor Hernandez. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk will call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. Item passes unanimously. Thank you. Then uh, I will now pass the gavel to our new chair, Friend. Thank you, um, Supervisor, Koenig, uh, Supervisor Koenig. Uh, we'll move on to item eight, which is a consideration of a resolution ratifying the proclamation of two local emergencies for the December 2022 and January 2023 atmospheric river winter storm events as proclaimed by the County Administrative Officer as the Director of Emergency Services on January 3rd, 2023, and a second on January 6, 2023, and take related actions as outlined in the memo of the CAO we do have the board memo as well as the resolutions and the emergency proclamations. Uh, with us today, we have uh, Dave Reed, who's the director of OR3, Matt Machado, who's our deputy county administrative officer and also the director of our CDI, and Chris Clark, who's our under sheriff. Um, Mr. Reed. Good morning, board. Good morning, chair. Welcome, Supervisor Cummings and Supervisor Hernandez. Um, <clears throat> this morning, we're going to take a few moments to overview what has transpired um, since uh, the 26th, 27th of December. I um, want to really highlight the efforts of my colleagues here sitting with me and their staff, as well as staff not represented here today, and then give you the best estimates to our current damage and the next steps with regards to the state um, and our next steps. Um, so just as a review of the storm events that have happened so far, and even over the course of this evening, we had um, this past evening, we had additional um, weather events causing outages. But as a reminder, um, on December 30th and 31st, we had an atmospheric river event that caused significant flooding along the San Lorenzo River, the Soquel Creek for the first time in 40 plus years, Aptos Creek, Coralitas and Salsipoitas Creek, we had significant landslides in the valley, in the San Lorenzo Valley and throughout the mountain, mountainous region and numerous road failures. Uh, on behalf of the CAO office, acting um, CAO uh, Nicole Coburn um, ratified, uh, proclaimed an emergency on the 3rd of January, and we'll be discussing that um, as part of the resolution today. Then again, on the 4th and 5th, um, we were forecasted to have another significant atmospheric river event um, the magnitude of rain was not realized based on the forecasting. However, the extreme winds from that storm event combined with extreme tidal swell and high tides um, around the full moon caused um, catastrophic damage to our coastal zone. Additional slope failures, um, but the brunt of that storm was felt in our coastal zone. We proclaimed again, uh, Supervisor, or Sorry, Administ County Administrative Officer Palacios um, declared another emergency on the 6th. Um, we did that in light of the fact that uh, we're trying to follow guidance from the state um, regarding some of this, the sequencing of these events. Um, our, our expectation and our impression is that this is one, one continuous event, one continuous emergency, but we've proclaimed again. Um, and then uh, on the 8th and 9th, we had another atmospheric river event occur, um, more significant flooding in the San Lorenzo River, additional landslides in the San Lorenzo Valley, cutting off big portions of the San Lorenzo Valley. Soquel Village flooded again, so twice in one week, um, not something we've seen again in over 40 years. We had flooding again in Aptos Creek, Coralitas, and Salsipuedas. 
And this storm impacted the Pajaro River flood basin, um, causing the evacuation of close to 30,000 people. Um, and we've had additional landslides. So a significant amount of um, impact to our community over the last um, 10 days or so, and the efforts of, of the sheriff's office, our community development and infrastructure, and our entire county family um, has been tremendous. And the coordination between county organizations, county agencies, as well as the city of Watsonville, the city of Santa Cruz, the city of Capitola, and the county of Monterey, Monterey has been integral in our response strategies and keeping life and property and uh, folks safe. So I wanna um, first show quickly some, some highlighted pictures. There are far more out there, but I wanna highlight the geographic distribution of our damage. Um, the coastal zone was, was spectacular and is, has drawn national media attention, but our community members throughout um, Santa Cruz County have been impacted from mudslides in our mountainous regions, to road failures along our county maintained road network. Um, and we'll get into some of the specifics of those in a little bit. Um, to flooding, as I said, in Soquel Village and in South County. Uh, and then the wave surge and storm surge damage to our coastal zone. This is um, the Rio Del Mar Aptos area. These are waves from that event crashing into some of the homes. This is the home that was pushed off its foundation by that storm event. I also want to take a brief second to highlight some of our partners. Um, we coordinated with the Metro um, during that middle storm event um, to evacuate over 200 elementary school kids from Marin County um, to keep them safe. Um, so Metro has been a great partner in coordinating that uh, movement. We moved them out of the valley to Scotts Valley. Um, coordinated with the city of Scotts Valley on that. And then we got those community, those kids home safely um, before the brunt of that storm hit. And obviously we, we, we've been working very closely with our CAL FIRE partners and the state on delivering tons and tons of sand. So this is just a picture of sand being delivered to the Davenport Resource Center um, to provide sand and sandbagging capacity to the community up in the North Coast. But we've had sand delivered throughout the county by our CDI staff as well as state support. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to Under Sheriff Clark. Well, good morning board uh, and welcome Supervisor Hernandez and Supervisor Cummings. Uh, Chris Clark, Under Sheriff of Santa Cruz County. And really, I just wanna give some of the highlights of our activities and really uh, that of your law and fire teams kind of throughout this entire event. Frankly, it really unprecedented event, as you know, impacting folks in all the communities that you serve, that we serve. Um, to see some of these pictures, it really doesn't do it justice. I was driving around yesterday. I know you uh, likely you've been out looking at your impacted communities and just the, the impact to the people living there is just unprecedented. SoCal Village flooding twice in a matter of eight days, just incredible. The storm surge that we saw impacting Beach Drive, Las Olas, uh, in, in the city of Capitola and Santa Cruz, just, just uh, really unprecedented. Um, I'm going to highlight a few things that that we've kind of uh, been focused on over the last eight to nine days, our evacuation planning. I'm going to touch on Zone Haven, Unified Command staffing, and then jail operations. So as uh, as Supervisor McPherson said, really, if there was a teacher when it came to us for, um, and we're, 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 we're good at critical incidents, but the CZU really, I think, prepared us in a, in a kind of a a really sort of terrible way in terms of really the the importance of unified command, getting everybody together. Um, and and I will say just just to kind of note back up just a minute is that is unprecedented. A lot of this a lot of this damage is the impact. Uh, we've only seen one death, which granted one death is is frankly too many. But I mean to think that so far we've gotten through what we have with only that one death. Is, is pretty remarkable. But in terms of evacuation and planning, um, you know, as we saw this storm approach and on New Year's Eve, as we knew we needed to evacuate people, our teams really sprang into action. We developed Unified Command, which uh, essentially is just all of our, all the law and fire, fire partners coming together, getting on the same page and really looking at how do we share resources? How do we coordinate response? How do we, how do we work together to really get uh, the help to where we need it, right? And in, and in that sense, um, and in terms of unified command, it is something that I think in this event, you know, where law and fire is, you know, that it's more, it's comes as more second nature to us. 
it's a multi-jurisdictional incident, obviously, as you know, through this through this event. And so I think it just highlights the 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 the, the importance of multiple entities working together to move in the same direction. And so uh, we got into unified command. We've had unified command meetings with all the law, law and fire uh, partners here in the county uh, every day from New Year's Eve on. In terms of staffing, uh, we've uh, we we went our office as well as I know other police agencies went to 20 uh, went to 12 hour shifts for us that gave us a lot of flexibility um, at the peak we had about 29 deputies working during day shift about 16 at night obviously we need to get through the evacuations and I'll talk about the evacuated areas here in just a second but obviously we needed the staffing and the flexibility to get into those areas to note to notify people and so that's ultimately where we started was not noticing folks uh, doing the uh, doing the messaging through social media through press releases having our deputies go door to door doing that and by you know doing that bilingual and in terms of even Watsonville and, and some of the affected communities down there making sure that even when we went to an evacuation warning we handed out literature both in English and Spanish letting folks know what to expect where to go and things like that in terms of when they needed to leave what what could they do and where could they go and so we hit about 560 homes and I'll go through the areas it doesn't seem like a lot but frankly uh, it, it was a, a fairly big lift um, and I can tell you it, it, we're, we're working on the numbers but it seems like about half the residents stayed at least from from what we're what we're getting back but again that those evacuations started um, and just to kind of give you a kind of a time sequence as you saw um, uh, Mr. Reed talk about kind of the, the the weather systems as they played out when I when I talk about the unprecedented nature of kind of just the flow of operations to think that we had uh, evacuations New Year's Eve we had evacuations again January 3rd evacuations again January 5th for the storm surge and then evacuations again as recent as yesterday and so and we're going to continue to watch the weather as we go forward frankly I, I I'm interested to see I mean knowing just how odd this whole event is. I think the, the real question is how does this play out in the future? And really what does this look, you know, look to us and, and folks that live here? So with regards to the evacuated areas over the course of those four different events, I can tell you that in the San Lorenzo Valley, we saw flooding in Ben Loman in the Mill Street area. Uh, Felton Grove in Paradise Park uh, took an unprecedented amount of water. I was out there yesterday, probably at least four feet. I could see as folks were kind of trying to clean up mud and other issues there. Uh, the Riverside, or I'm sorry, and then Paradise Park and then the Riverside Avenue area in Ben Loman saw water as well. In terms of the central portion of the county, downtown Soquel, as I mentioned, flooded twice, as you know. Um, and then Soquel Wharf Road uh, in the Aptos area, we we did evacuations in the Rio Del Mar area where we saw two, in at least a couple feet of water there in, in, in the Rio Flats. Uh, Beach Drive was hit hard by storm surges, as you've seen the pictures, as well as Los Olas and the Potbelly Beach area. And then working towards South County, really the impacts of the Salsipuetas Creek, Coralitas Creek, and really the Pajaro River for which we continue to monitor even today. So um, that, that, that's a little bit of the highlights of the areas that we evacuated. In terms of the jail operations, I can tell you we, we breathed a little bit uh, bigger of a sigh of relief there when we when we did some research, thanks to uh, Public Works and, and uh, Mr. Machado in terms of really trying to define what our threat is at the main jail. And what we learned was that the levee is higher on that side. Uh, there was some development that, that went into that to, to better protect the main jail so that we didn't have to look at doing, uh, even though that was a concern, doing major a major evacuation of the main jail, which uh, it is, as you would, could imagine, a, a pretty serious undertaking. So with that, that, it's a little bit of the highlights. Uh, we still have weather to look towards. Um, I can tell you that uh, in terms of law and fire, you know, we're, we're committed to, to continue to do the, the, the message that we've been doing, the door-to-door -door messaging, um, and really committed to, to helping people uh, get through what, what frankly, is just uh, it hasn't happened before. And so we're going to continue to do that and committed to doing that. And thank you. Thank you, Chris and Dave. Uh, good morning, Chair and Supervisors Matt Machado, your CDI director, and welcome Supervisor Cummings and Supervisor Hernandez. Uh, this morning, I'd like to give a, just a brief overview of the efforts of community development infrastructure, which, as you all know, is the, the merge of the Department of Public Works and the Department of Planning together. And it's been a great team. There's a lot of great support out there. Uh, through these series of storms, the efforts uh, through the department have included our roads crew, our drainage crew, our flood control, uh, group, our solid waste team, our sanitation operations, our geology team, and our building section. A lot of people in the field working around the clock. Uh, the, roads the roads crew in particular worked around the clock uh, for all these storms from the beginning, from New Year's Eve on. Uh, to date, we have 11 
uh, sites with permanent longer term damage that we'll need to uh, make repairs on. Uh, through each storm, we saw upwards of 45 storm damage, storm damage roads closed due to trees, wires, landslides, uh, various um, storm damage uh, related. And then the next day, the crews get out there and they clear that up and get those roads open. They've been working nonstop trying to get those roads open. I will share quickly that uh, we have one road in particular, uh, Redwood Road, where the road has collapsed and has trapped people. And so our crews have been focusing on those areas to get them open, to get people access. Uh, and that's what they've been doing for the past uh, week. Um, currently in the roads operation group, we have 11 emergency contracts with private contractors to help assist us with tree removal, debris removal, uh, repairing roads when we can. Uh, they've done a lot of work up in the Lompico area. That's been a, a constant um, problem up there with closures due to all sorts of um, challenges. In our uh, drainage group, uh, they've been very, very busy with debris removal at all uh, river crossings, at all culverts. Uh, they also have been doing levee patrols um, throughout the night, 24-hour levee patrol. Our flood control team, they've been monitoring the rivers and streams around the clock. Our uh, solid waste group, interestingly, they've been providing amazing support with landfill operations and, and dumpsters as needed. And so it really does take a team and the Department of Community Development Infrastructure has that team in place. Uh, additionally, our sanitation group, uh, they manage uh, some water systems and many sanitation districts. Davenport was hit extra hard in the first round of storms. Uh, we actually were cut off from our primary uh, water source. And so we, thankfully, we have a secondary source. We went to the secondary source for a number of days until we could clear the uh, the intake up in San Vicente uh, Creek. And so that's been a, a very large lift. Uh, the sanitation group also has been clearing all of our uh, storm or uh, sewer pump stations. We have about 60 pump stations across the county and they notoriously take debris in from the storm and so they're constantly out there removing debris, keeping the generators working uh, for power just so that our systems will continue to work. Our geology team has been uh, out in the field continuously, weather permitting, of course, uh, monitoring landslides and unstable ground, uh, mostly up in the, in the mountains, but also along the coastline. We've had a lot of issues, as, as Director Reed mentioned, uh, the, coastal got, the coastal areas got impacted heavily and our geology team was there to uh, ensure safety for our, our community. Our building inspectors and, and building section have been out inspecting buildings. Um, they've issued 132 yellow tags. That means that uh, that's moderate damage to homes and, and has some limited uh, use, but uh, people are still able to, to stay in those homes for the most part, but we'll have to follow up and, and look at those repairs. They've also had to place eight red tags and that's of before this last storm. All the numbers I'm sharing this morning are as of yesterday. So it does not include last night's storm. So eight red tags means you cannot occupy. So we'll be following up on those. We do expect uh, more building inspections, more red tags, more yellow tags. Um, we actually expect even more uh, permanent road closures. And uh, Dave will be discussing some of the, the costs on, on those issues here soon. I wanna end on a couple of notes. Uh, with regard to our permanent damage repair, uh, we will have to prioritize these repairs. The magnitude of them are, is such that we won't be able to fix them all at once. And so similar to 2017 storms, we have to prioritize and do the worst first for various reasons. We have a lot of factors that'll go into that. And we look forward to working with each of your district offices to explain the whys and the wheres and the wins, because that's important to all of our community members, all of your constituents. Uh, also, uh, we'll continue to assess damage and, and clean up the storm uh, debris, even from this last storm. Uh, the winds have really impacted the trees across our roads, and so there's a lot of cleanup work. So it'll take us a number of days. Uh, we do look forward to keeping your board informed and all of your offices informed on our progress and our efforts going forward. Thank you. 
So I just want to take a quick second to highlight your emergency operations center staff and what's been going on um, to coordinate a lot of the efforts um, on behalf of the community, in addition to the work that um, has been articulated by Under Sheriff Clark and, and <laughs> Deputy CAO Machado. Um, our EOC staff has been amazing um, over the last 10 days coming in over the holiday and over weekends. Um, the biggest lift for us, just as a context, is really the shelter and care operations as we issued the evacuations, as Under Sheriff Clark mentioned. You know, we need to stand up shelters. So our um, health and human services departments have been phenomenal. Staff has been working very hard around the clock. We set up seven shelters, either collaboratively with the cities or individually um, during the first two storms. And then due to the scale and magnitude of the evacuations associated with the Pajaro River, we prepared for or opened eight additional shelters, or not additional, but eight shelter locations in preparation. Um, we had we had over 100 um, folks, um, close to 150 folks at our fairgrounds last night. Um, and that takes a tremendous amount of logistical support. So our general services staff director, um, Beaton uh, and his team has been instrumental in managing the, the logistics. Has been They have been pushing um, state resource requests up on behalf of the county and behalf of the cities. So as a context, um, because this in, has been so impactful across the county and to our cities, the cities cannot make resource requests to the state. We have to make resource requests on behalf of the cities to the state. So they have been managing the logistical efforts on that regard with regards to sand and other care and shelter resources. And then obviously public information is a huge effort. Um, all of you serve in that role as well. Um, and we've had a, a, a large team trying to, to, to get information out as quickly and efficiently as we can, um, update our website, created a landing page um, as met all of you know, and we've been trying to update that continuously as shelter information changes, as press releases come out. So our EOC operations staff, I just wanna highlight their efforts as well and appreciate the, the care and effort they've put in um, over the last 10 days as well. So as um, Deputy Director um, Machado said, um, we've, we've got best estimates for damages and this does not include state, uh, city damages yet. So similar to resource requests, the cities will all be issuing their initial damage estimates um, to the county and we'll be submitting all of that to the state um, these numbers um, represent our best estimates right now. Um, so road damage in excess of 21 million, um, park damages at 16 different sites and three coastal access sites in excess of 6.8 million. The San Lorenzo Valley Water District sustained over a million dollars in damage to some of their primary water distribution infrastructure. And again, this does not include um, all of the information and it does not include the most recent storms um, on the 8th and 9th. Um, we're still uh, gathering the information um, around those emergency contract numbers, and then the city information um, is coming forthcoming. The other thing I want to highlight, um, and it was brought up by uh, Mr. Machado, is that we've received at one rain gauge, as an example, we've received 20, over 20 inches, over 23 inches, in fact, of rain in the last 10 days. In 2017, at that same rain gauge, we had over 50 inches of rain in six weeks. So this is unprecedented, um, but not unfamiliar territory, and we're not out of the woods, and we're certainly not setting up 2023 to be um, better than uh, 2017. It certainly could be worse. So it's something that obviously we're all looking at very closely. Our hills and mountains and streams are saturated and full. And even smaller events now um, that come and hit us in, in short succession could have much more impactful um, damage uh, effects. So to date right now, um, the state declared an emergency, an open-ended emergency, an ongoing emergency on the 4th of January. Um, so there hasn't been a completion or a time window defined for that yet. And then we did get the federal emergency declaration on the 9th. And what that means, they're following the, the federal government is following for us here in California, a similar model to what they do um, nationally for hurricanes. So ahead of, ahead of a hurricane, they'll declare a state of emergency that's open-ended and gives the authority to 
um, to cover category B, which is kind of the emergency opening expenses. We expect that a disaster will be declared by the federal government. Um, and we are hoping and expecting that the window of that, that disaster declaration will include all of our storms to date and anything, hopefully not, but anything moving into the future so that it encompasses all the damage that we have they sustained. Next steps, obviously, we're closely monitoring the weather. Um, we'll be begin um, developing a recovery debris removal operations program. Um, and we're going to make sure uh, to support recovery um, rebuild efforts. It's different than the fire um, where most folks, again, not everyone, um, but most folks did not lose their entire home and all of their belongings, but the damage is significant and they will need to do repairs. Um, and then obviously we'll be working on the state and federal claim process um, as we move forward on behalf of the cities and the county. So again, before you, your recommended actions and ready for any questions. Thank you, Director Reed, Director Machado, and under Sheriff Clark. Um, I imagine there are supervisors with questions. Uh, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, there's, uh, first of all, thank you for the coordinated effort and thank heavens. Um, we have that amongst us with the cities, counties, fire districts, wherever it might be, water districts. Uh, thank you all for the coordinated effort. As bad as it is, it could be much worse if we didn't have that going for us in Santa Cruz County. Um, I um, it, it just, you know, in listen to uh, Director Machado, we have 600 miles of roadway in this county of un in the unincorporated area. And people say, well, gee, why didn't you fix this to get ready for this kind of a storm? There's just no way to do that, to know where the, the trees are. So I hope people, and for the most part, people have had patience, but uh, it happens. And the immediate response that you've had is really impressive from your public works department in particular. Uh, and I really do appreciate it. Um, the um, the amount of uh, rain that is, is falling, do we have any idea, and, and this is kind of an, an offshoot of the storm damage, but what impact has that had in the law of Coloma? How much is it, do you know how much that's come up? Uh, it was down to about half or less, I think. Yeah, um, we got confirmation as, as we were concerned about this last storm uh, and the effects on the San Lorenzo River. We did get confirmation that Loch Lomond is 100% full and spilling over its sure. spillway. Yeah, okay. All right. Well, I just I really appreciate your prioritizing the uh, the damages. Um, we were landlocked for the most part in Santa Cruz County. I know, I know there's just a few routes in and out right now. And I do appreciate not only the coordinated effort with the, the departments within the county, but uh, our coordinated efforts with the cities too, because I know in the South County, uh, probably next to the area along with San Lorenzo Valley has been hit the hardest of the two areas in the uh, in the county. So I do appreciate everything that you have done. Um, the the red tags and yellow tags, um, they, they uh, it's hard to say how long it'll take for them to get back. I mean, these storms are going to continue. So are, are those uh, homes that are next to them? I'm thinking of Beach Drive and Rio Del Mar, um, where the one house was just taken off its foundation. Were there any other threats similar to that? Yeah, up in the uh, San Lorenzo Valley, we had a number of uh, pretty major yeah. uh, damage sites, uh, houses sliding off their foundations or, or being jeopardized by landslides and earth movement. So I would say um, um, maybe not in the same magnitude, but very close to the same magnitude, uh, our mountain communities were hit pretty hard structurally. Yeah. Well, it's probably not even proper thing to say, but thank God this didn't happen within a year after the CZU fire, because I can't imagine what the debris flow impact would have been, but it's, it's terrible enough as it is. But uh, thank you very much, everybody, for the efforts that you put in. Thank you, Supervisor Next first, and Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair Friend. Uh, first, I want to start by thanking everyone in the Emergency Operations Center. I know you guys have been working very long hours through multiple weekends now and through the New Year's holiday. Uh, thank you for your frequent communications, including our assistant CAOs, uh, Assistant CAO Coburn and Benson. Um, it, it's, it's really been all hands on deck, and I think it has showed. Um, I know particularly the action between between storms, as was mentioned, clearing the roadways, uh, getting the sandbag station set up uh, was really appreciated and people felt like uh, we were there for them. Um, so thank you. Um, a question in particular about SoCal Village. I know, um, you know, with that 
that rapid first flood that we saw, um, we believe that you know that it might have been caused by some debris build up, some wood under bridges. Do we still think? I, I I know between storm events we made an effort to clear those. Do we still think that's what caused it, given that we saw the second flooding? Sure, I'll I'll take a run at that. Uh, no, we we don't know that it was the debris that caused it. When we actually did some investigative work after the calm of that storm. Uh, it looked like it It was not um, just from the debris. It was just from the amount of water coming down. We don't know exactly uh, that slug of water that, you know, if it was just due to straight rainfall or if it was some accumulation that released, it's hard to say. Uh, but at least down in the village area, I'm sure debris was a factor, but it wasn't a primary factor. It was just the, the sheer magnitude of the water that came down in a flash flood type of a situation is what we can see the evidence shows us i'm sure we'll follow up um and to your point you know we did have crews after the storm cleaning up removing as much debris as, as possible and so um i think that probably set us up a little better for the next one but to be honest again even the next storm was really about volume of water and not not just a debris analysis <laughs> Got it. Well, that sort of answers my next question, which is if there's anything we can do to more proactively manage some of the, the creeks and riverbeds in order to prevent this kind of flooding. But uh, taking from your answer that no, it's just a matter of the volume of water. That's correct. Okay. Um, do we have any sense that oh, we're, we're uh, you know, issuing this emergency proclamation um, and that starts the the long process uh, for the state and federal claims, do we have any sense of how long it'll be before businesses and um, residents can apply for some kind of assistance? Yeah, I think one of the key things that we're waiting for, and, and this is the coordination with the cities, is once we once we ask for support, ask for financial support at the state and federal level, we have a time clock associated with that. And by that, what what I mean is that we have to submit all of our paperwork and the initial damage estimates to um, the state. So we want to make sure that we get best estimates from the cities, coordinate submitting that ask and submitting the, um, the request for support soon, um, ideally this week, um, that we send that stuff up. But, but we want to make sure to not be premature ahead of the cities and, and put them in a stressful situation uh, to getting that information to us. So my hope is that we're able to put that together very so shortly and then be able to make those requests and get those resources coming back down for businesses and individuals. And then, I mean, businesses and individuals will actually have to apply themselves for some kind of assistance, right? Yeah. So when, when might that window open? So uh, I can't give you a firm window, um, but we will be asking for SBA support. So that's the business side. Um, and the, an SBA program is, is what they describe and call it. Um, and I, I don't unfortunately have information on how quickly from ask to program implementation that takes, but I'll be finding that out and updating your offices. Okay. Thanks. We'll look forward to getting that information out to people. I know they're, they're eager to uh, understand more about what they can do next. And I think at this point, the best is just to document everything for claims. Um, I mean, I do, you know, surprise McPherson mentioned, uh, the, you know, it's a good thing this didn't happen right on the heels of the CZU fire. Um, I think the good, the good news is it's not the first time we've dealt with rebuild after disaster. We've got the contract with Four Leaf. Um, you know, I do think that we should consider um, extending that contract to uh, victims of this disaster, uh, so that we can, um, you know, just use that accelerated rebuild process uh, to to apply to this as well. I um, look forward to working with Supervisor Friend on bringing something before the board to consider. Um, I also think, you know, ultimately, uh, every way possible, we should look for opportunities to build back better. Um, you know, it's, it's clear now with the 2016, 17 storms and, and this, I mean, we were still digging our way out of the repairs for the 2016, 17 storms. I think we were about two thirds of the way through that. Um, and now to get hit with this again, I mean, any opportunity we can, we need to look for making our infrastructure more resilient, um, and, you know, and incentivizing people to move to safer areas if, if needed as well. So thanks again, everyone. Thank you, Supervisor Koenig. Supervisor Cummings. I just wanted to start by thanking county staff and the Emergency Operations Center for all the hard work and time that you all have been putting into responding and to helping our community address this crisis. 
Um, I know that, you know, as people have been reaching out to me, I've been able to reach out to county staff and get responses pretty quickly to be able to get back to people and help them meet their needs. And, and I will say with the consolidation of all the websites onto a single landing page has really been helpful just to give somebody, give people just one place where they can go to a one-stop shop of information. I think it's been really helpful for people to understand how they can find out information about roads and resources. Um, and so it's been really helpful to see that it stood up so quickly. So thank you all for that and for all your time that you've been putting in. Um, I, a number of my questions have already been asked, um, but I do, uh, I did want to ask, you know, what can we anticipate in the next coming days with weather events that, that might be continuing to impact uh, the community? Yeah, I think, we, you know, we're watching that closely. We've been coordinating daily, oftentimes at three and five in the morning with our national weather service partners. And, and what we're learning, right, is they're doing the best they can to forecast for us. And forecasts don't always meet reality on both ends of that. They sometimes are more intense and sometimes less. But as Under Sheriff Clark mentioned, we're looking at the next most impactful storm over the weekend. But um, we're all becoming armchair meteorologists and we're recognizing that the best available data to make the best available decisions in terms of life and safety are sometimes in that kind of 24 to 48 hour window when the, the models, the climate models are more accurate. So we'll be watching closely to see how that progresses in the forecasting um, and, and keep you all apprised as, as to what the weekend looks like. And then the next question I had, um, you know, we've stood up a number of shelters, some of which have actually helped to um, shelter the unhoused. And we've been having people, I've had people ask me, you know, where can we volunteer? Are there opportunities to volunteer um, to kind of help in understanding that a lot of folks are, there's a lot of work that's being put on our staff and and sometimes having some volunteers could help alleviate some of the stress with that. And so I was just curious if there are opportunities for people, if they want to volunteer, who should they contact and, and what can they expect to do? Or is that not something that's being offered at this time. No, that it's absolutely being offered. There's actually a link on our website um, on the landing page that you referenced to the volunteer center. Um, but there are also, and and not to diminish the or or not to highlight the efforts of our community partners. There are a lot of community partner organizations throughout the county, and particularly in the South County, that are working very hard on behalf of the community and on behalf of the folks that they serve. So certainly if folks want to volunteer broadly, um, they can go to the volunteer center and, and find a, an opportunity perhaps. But also a lot of those organizations, if they have relationships with folks like Community Bridges or Community Action Board as two examples of many, um, you know, those community organizations are out there serving and um, they could volunteer certainly with those folks as well. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Supervisor Cummings. Supervisor Hernandez. Thank you. I also too would like to thank everyone from the, all the county employees from the CAO's office, uh, EOC, uh, the road crews and all the public work staff, and especially the sheriffs that were out there at five in the morning alerting people out there in South County. And of course, all our partners, um, Cal Fire, Metro, all the other agencies that were involved. And, you know, for all your work and all your collaboration too with all the other agencies too. Um, I had a couple of, you know, uh, uh, I guess some concerns and some questions that I had is uh, from it would be be good if we can assure that um, anything that like the uh, press releases and uh, social media posts that we have them bilingual too uh, for folks out there in South County. A lot of folks were asking me for bilingual uh, materials. I know the website has a uh, uh, you can. Uh, translate it but for stuff like social media posts and stuff like the the uh the press releases if we can have them in pdf in spanish so we can you know share those with folks um a lot of folks a lot of the nonprofits wanted that stuff as well too um you know in south county we have 85 percent latino so it'd be it'd behoove us to have those materials over there um the other thing i think um supervisor koenig was asking about it but i wanted to ask you know there's there's um the creek over on Chittenden or Chittenden Dam. There's a there's a I guess the USGS has a site where they monitor the 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 river, the creek there. And I guess the county monitors the Paro River at the bridge. Um is you know, given that the creeks in South County uh are prone to flooding, the um 
especially the South Cypress, Coralitos, and the new Cower Creek. Is there a way that we can monitor that and set up a, a form of scale that that we can, the public can look at on a website that we can, you know, the public make it safe for the public to look at? Because you know, I get these uh, alerts from the USGS about the Chittenden that gives me some kind of idea about the uh, Paro River, and so. It'd be good if you know we can make it public um, to see where these creeks are at because it came all of a sudden at college in her lake and area at Houlihan. It just came all of a sudden uh, without notice. So if there's a way that we can monitor that and set up a scale system, you know, with, whether it's I think it's uh, at Shittaden it's 25, it becomes the danger zone, but 32 is like major flooding. But if there's some kind of system that we can set up in the future. Yes. So that's a great question. And, and we do have that system in place today. If you go to the uh, public works webpage and under the flood control, it's called uh, one rain and you can get rainfall data, but more importantly to your, to your question, you can get all those stream gauges and there's different ways to look at it. And, and to be honest, I, the one I like is to see all the different gauges at once with the numbers and then you click on them and they go from green to yellow to red. And then if you click on one in particular, like if you're really interested in the Pajaro, you can see all the different stages with definitions and descriptions and things to worry about and where the, the risk points are. And it's really informative. And one I really like about the Pajaro watershed is that it goes well beyond our own county borders. It goes all the way down uh, well, well into San, through San Benito into uh, Monterey County. And it shows the entire watershed, which goes down, it's got to be 40, 50 miles. Uh, and you can see the San Benito Creek flowing. And you can see the reservoirs above the Paja River flowing. And you can see all that data in one spot. It's very, very helpful. And uh, I'd be happy to, to show you the inner workings of it. It's, it is, um, it's public facing. Everybody has access to it. It's very easy to use. It's click and point and see and uh, and it's useful you can see and if uh with just a little bit of you know looking at it you can see as the water is coming down through the system you can expect it and so beyond just you know a national weather forecast of rivers and streams you can almost make your own assessment not that any of us are the experts for it but from a community standpoint you can anticipate as these creeks start to rise you can see the rate of rise and it's very helpful it's a graphical uh, map-based tool. So happy to walk you through that. Okay. So it's similar to the USGS one where they put that rating system, like 25 feet, you're it in is. danger. It is. 33 feet is flooding. Yes. Okay. User-friendly. Very user-friendly. Okay. Yes. And just for, for, for you and, and the community, we've linked the, the site um, that He's mentioning um, on that landing page under the monitoring. There's a there's a little tab on the on that landing page that has all of our evacuation and shelter information. There's a monitoring and there's a link in there as well. So Do you know where the monitors are for Salsipuedes and Coralitos Creeks. Uh, yes, in fact, uh, if you if you can if you want to zoom in the map, you can see exactly where the gauge is on the creek. Um, I don't don't have it in front of me at the moment, but. Um, I'll tell you the one that I watch the most closely is the Pahar River at Chittenden because it's, oh, yeah. it's far enough out where you can see it and it, there's a lot of good descriptive information to see the water. But uh, in terms of the other creeks, um, we've got gauge information that you could zoom in and understand exactly where they're taking those measurements from. Well, the reason I bring it up is because I think, you know, we're going to have the federal flood project. But I think the creeks are always going to be concerned, and we're either going to have to work on them and or make sure that we have some kind of, uh, you know, good gauging and monitoring of these creeks. Well, we uh, just a bit of a side note, but you mentioned the federal project, and so uh, some of those creeks are going to be addressed. In fact, uh, phase one is the Coralitas Creek all the way back to Green Valley. Green Valley. So, let's go ahead. So it's a, it's a, it's a very large magnitude project. So, but to your point, yes, we'll have to continue to uh, improve our monitoring skills and, and keep that up because even with the project in place, we'll still have to keep an eye on it. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn to Supervisor McPherson in a second. So the Sasaquedes gauge is about Lakeview and 129 in essence in that area. And the Coralitas is, um, at 
uh, right off of Freedom and uh, basically Airport or Hulahan, right around that corner, where it combines. Supervisor McPherson? Yeah, I, I don't want to get um, on the wrong side of the Federal Emergency Management Agency or FEMA, but uh, we haven't seen uh, what we really asked for from 2016, 17, and now we have this another crisis. Is there any way that we have changed our method of application or to make them more responsive? Yeah, I'd like to ask um, Marcus Pimentel, our county budget manager, who's been working on this um, very um, hard to try and get us our reimbursements and working with our federal partners and our legislative representatives. Yeah, it's really a nature of FEMA's overwhelmed with the COVID event that has impacted every community across the entire country. They have a lot of staff rotations. It's, it's a concern we have. We were concerned before COVID. We're concerned during COVID. Now we've been con very concerned with CZU. We've had claims that um, are nearly 70 million that are, I keep using the word stuck for no better lack of a term, year in the process. And there's just not a lot of activity. Um, I'm thankful for the, the supervisors and their staff, uh, in particular the Supervisor Friend's office, who's been very helpful to helping us get some congressional support and 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 that congressional support is there. So I think we've got a great, uh, a strong story to tell. And for us, it's just advocating and making sure our voice is heard. I mean, there's really no problem, there's no problem with how we're submitting and the timeliness of which we submit, we're very timely. It's just the nature of FEMA is very overwhelmed and um, Maybe sometimes we don't have a lot of a, enough voice or recognition. That's understood. Thank you. And one other thing, um, it, as terrible as this is, uh, I got to go back and say to thank you to the voters in 19 or 2016 for approving Measure D and for the state legislature uh, approving Senate Bill 1. I mean, if we would have had, wouldn't have had the road improvements that we were able to accomplish in the last six, seven years, this could have been much, much worse again. But uh, so I think that needs to be recognized. Thank you, Supervisor. Before I open up to the community, I'll make some brief comments. I also appreciate the work, in particular, the work of the Sheriff's Office in South County. I mean, going door to door, uh, being with us uh, as we did that outreach to those communities, uh, being in constant contact with our office has been remarkable. Uh, I do have a brief question about the Redwood situation. I mean, is there any timeline at all, even a best estimate as far as uh, providing something in or is there at least an engineering analysis to understand what might be provided uh, sure. over that opening? Sure, so I think by midday, we'll know uh, which plan is gonna work the best, and then we'll have a better idea of how quickly we'll get it repaired. Uh, I think our our best option today is, is probably using rock to fill it back in. Uh, there's just not enough stability to put a temporary bridge out there. So we think uh, it's probably a fill and get access that way. But I think by midday, we should have a sense of that and we'll let you know. I appreciate it. Um, and I know that Director Reed had mentioned uh, communications and the PIO, and I appreciate the work of the PIO team. And also that we're in, there are different people that are experiencing this disaster in different ways, and there are different phases of it. We've got people that still haven't experienced it yet that are about to experience something in the coming rains. We have people that are in the middle of a disaster and people that are in the recovery stage. And I want to make sure that we are as a county, addressing all three of those phases in our communications and making sure that we're proactively providing for whatever people's needs are, it's it's um, it's understandable that when you're you're in the middle of 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 a current event that the others um, uh, don't have maybe the same level of priority. But I think to the degree that we can think about bifurcating or trifurcating, if that's a word, just made a word up, uh, into a situation that 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 communications allows for those different. Uh, situations because in all of our offices we're hearing from people in different phases of it uh, and and uh, to supervisor Cummings question about what's coming next uh, but I just think that that's something that we could we could uh, we could improve in that regard I'd like to open it up for the community now for is there any member of the community who'd like to address us on this item before we take these recommended actions please step forward Good morning. Thank you, everyone, um, for the wonderful update. I just had a question. Does Santa Cruz County have a community emergency response team so that the community and citizens can be ahead of some of these natural disasters and the inevitable responses and predictable um, calamities that happen? When I resided in a Northern California community, we had that. So the community the community members 
or in their own neighborhood groups, meeting on a regular basis and um, practicing for these kinds of emergencies to um, be an immediate help. Um, one thing I noticed is I was trapped up in the Bonnie Dune area by two roads cut off via trees falling down on power lines. And it seems to me that these are preventable through proactive planning and strategy to keep the power lines clear um, so that communities aren't shut off for indefinite amount of times on power. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else like to address us from Chambers, please? Yeah, my name is James. You know, I really appreciate the three individuals who are describing what's going on in the macro. Um, I would love to expand that. I mean, in the micro, I would love to expand that in the uh, macro. You guys didn't mention um, that PG&E has actually brought down a lot of equipment in the past couple of weeks, a lot from out of state as well. Um, but to address the community member, I've been living in, I started living in the Santa Cruz Mountains, 92, 93, excuse me, 93, 94. I probably called um, emergency services 50 times for lines that were down. It's just really commonplace. So it's interesting that we're discussing the really short-term events going on, but it seems quite phenomenal that in this board and what seems to be indoctrinated that we are heading towards global warming, which um, like most of the things that go on in this room are the exact opposite of reality if people would just open their eyes and do their own research. So I do thank the individuals for everything that is going on, but um, are individual, individuals really being prepared for what could continue to happen? I mean, how is this going to change our drought situation? Are the people that decide to drain our reservoirs going to do it again like they did in 2020? Who knows? Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else in chambers? Seeing none, is there anybody on Zoom? Yes, Chair, we do have speakers online. Call in user ending in 2915. Your microphone is now available. Hello, this is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, I appreciate this presentation, and I want to thank PG&E for really coming to this county in full force. I like their staging area at the former Skyview Drive-In. That's a great place. I was happy to hear that the county fairgrounds is being used. The county has an MOU with the fairgrounds for just this purpose. I hope that the kitchens there are being used to provide food rather than what happened during the CZU fire, prepackaged meals that created a lot of waste were brought in. And I'm glad Cabrillo College is also being used. Um, this issue really brings to the forefront the importance of our keeping the Watsonville Airport open and available. So uh, please, in any future land use decisions, support the airport. Um, Aptos Creek Channel at the uh, SoCal Drive overcrossing needs attention. I was looking at that yesterday and the flow of the creek is now directed toward the uh, restaurant side and um, I'm quite fearful that that could cause some scouring and the stabilization there. Proactively, I wonder why the uh, pumps that uh, on the New Year's Day, New Year's Eve storm uh, failed to function. And I was told that was part of the problem for the flooding that occurred along the Bridge Street area in Watsonville. And so I would like the supervisors and Department of Public Works to implement a, a, a proactive maintenance schedule for those pumps, even when we're not in flood stage. I want to also ask whether it is a wise decision to um, centralize our county communications to the county uh, warehouse out on Grimmer Road next to Holahan when it is now uh, at times flooded and inaccessible. Thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. Is there anybody else online? Yes. Call in user one. Your microphone is now available. This is Marilyn Garrett, and thank you for the report. And this is indeed a dire situation, and much appreciation to all the people who are working during this disaster. I, uh, you said FEMA is overwhelmed by the COVID event. Somebody said that. Um, 
from my reading, um, that was uh, a, a pandemic and when resources and lockdowns actually harm people, not help them, and deplete funds, uh, that um, damages the public. Um, I, um, I, I read this book called Living Downstream, An Ecologist Looks at Cancer and the Environment by Sandra Steingrub, Steingraber. And she said people got very good at rescuing those coming downstream who were in stages of drowning, but no one goes upstream to see who's pushing them in. And her book is a journey upstream to see what's causing the cancers. Now, in this instance, what is causing or some of the causes of these um, multiple disasters? And I want to refer you to something that lands inside. It's a website called geoengineeringwatch.org with Dane Wigington, and he talks about climate engineering, which there are patents for, being the elephant in the room to these disruptions. Patents are held by Harp, Raytheon, and Lockheed. And he Thank you, Ms. Said Garrett. Is there anybody else online? This is our last speaker. Mondo, your microphone is now available. Hello, can you, can you all hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Okay, I was especially moved by the staff member that was talking about how there's red tags and yellow tags being issued uh, throughout the county. And as we all know, we're facing an, an aging uh, community, and it's going to be extremely unlikely that uh, an elderly folk is going to be able to repair a busted roof, uh, a house off a foundation, or a road that's been washed away. Um, and, and to this point, I had a, uh, a family member who just graduated with his master's degree in architecture, and I saw him over Christmas, and his mother, who owns a property here as well as construction, had a stroke. And I was like, and I talked to him and I said, hey, you know, maybe you should consider moving back. Uh, we have a lifetime worth of work for you here and you can be close to your family. And his response was, and pardon my language, there's no way in hell I'd ever move back to Santa Cruz County. He says, the only way you can get anything built there is if your name is Barry Swenson or if it's some sort of government funded big housing project. The numbers just don't work out for a, for a small guys. Um, and, and to that point, over the years, you know, we've seen our labor force either age out, retire, or if they were young enough and healthy enough, they moved away to areas where, where you know, building is sustainable even during the good times. And I find it ironic that we're, we're facing a, a, a disaster now, but we're also facing disaster from the past because we no longer have the labor force now to, to move us forward. And I know that some of you are reaching out to get federal funds, and man, we are really hoping for you on that. But realize that that money is not gonna go nearly far as far if we don't fix our housing crisis. And to that point, um, Felipe, uh, you're also on the board of Cabrillo Trustees. Please let the, constru uh, the construction program at Cabrillo know that the community, that we love them and support them and wanna help Thank you. you. Are there any other speakers online? We have no further speakers, Chair. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, before we bring back to the board, just to address a couple of the questions that were raised. Yes, we do have a pretty robust CERT program in the county. You can go to SantaCruzCountyCERT.org to learn more about it. And pg and &E does have the ability online for you to file a request for tree trimming along power lines that you can do directly. Are there any members of the board that have any other comments or would it be appropriate now to make a motion? Supervisor Cummings. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chad. One one last comment, which was um, before we went out to public comment, I was just reminded that um, 
we also had heard some comments on uh, the communications when certain zones are becoming either under warnings or evacuation orders, that in addition to using the codes from Zone Haven, that we're also using the names of those neighborhoods because for some people, they might not know exactly what zone their neighborhood is coded for. But if you were to say, um, you know, it's, I don't know, near some streets in Bonnie Dune or, <clears throat> or Davenport Landing or what have you, that that might get people to, to, it might trigger them to know that that's, that they're a part of that evacuation warning area or that they're being evacuated um, because there were some comments that were made that, you know, during some television shows where we get the emergency notification and the banner runs across the bottom that it was just showing the zones and the codes for those zones rather than any description of the neighborhoods. So just wanted to mention that so that we keep that in mind when we're communicating with people about um, what zones are under warnings or uh, under evacuation orders. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Cummings. Is there a motion for the recommended actions? I'll move the recommended actions. Second. Okay. We have a motion from Supervisor Koenig and a second from Supervisor McPherson. If we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Friend? Aye. Item Thank passes you. unanimously. We will now move on to item nine, which is to consider selection of Team Sobrante, which is doing business as Artful Catalyst LLC is the public artist for the Live Oak Library Annex and improve the contract with Team Sobrante for an amount not to exceed $80,000 and take related actions as outlined in the memo of the Director of Parks, Open Space and Cultural Services. We have the agenda item report, the artist proposal and the contract. And I believe we have uh, Director Gaffney, the Director of Parks of our Parks Department, and uh, Commissioner Paula Woods as well. Director Gaffney. Good morning, Chairman Friend, and uh, welcome Supervisors Cummings and Hernandez. Uh, great to have you here. Um, Jeff Gaffney, as a, a Supervisor Friend pointed out, uh, the Director of Parks, Open Space, and Cultural Services. Um, I'm first of all, I just wanted to share my my true honor and and. Uh, support for what we did at the EOC and what we're continuing to do. It was really special to get a chance to work with Deputy CAO Machado and Under Sheriff Clark and Director Reed this last week or so. And it's, it's a lot of work and we're all a little exhausted. So it's nice to be here um, and not be at the EOC, but um, I just want to let you know incredible staff that they have working for them. And I felt really honored to be a part of that. And today we get to do something else, which is another wonderful thing that we get to do with government. Um, we get to talk about arts, um, which is really exciting. And so without any further ado, I'm going to introduce District 1 Arts Commissioner Paula Woods. She's going to come up and talk about two proposals, one for Aptos Library and the other one for the Live Oak Library Annex, which is coming back to you because we needed some direction on that and we listened. So thank you. Arts Commissioner Woods. Thank you. Good morning, board. My name is Paula Woods and I'm a County Art Commissioner. The Arts Commission is pleased to recommend for your approval today an artist proposal for the Live Oak Library Annex. A call to artists was issued and an art selection panel convened. Proposals were reviewed and the finalists were interviewed by the panel. Team Sobrante was selected to continue in the selection process. At the November 7, 2022 meeting, the Arts Commission reviewed the panel's decision and voted to recommend that your board approve the selection of Team Sobrante as a public artist for the Live Oak Library Annex. I'd now like to introduce to you the artist team who will give you a brief presentation of their proposal and then answer any questions you might have. So I'm honored to introduce David So and Linda, a.k.a. Team Sobrante. Good morning, board. Um, it is truly an honor to be presenting our work um, called Letters for Live Oak Library Annex Public Art Project. Um, it's, is that gonna be safe, stable? Okay. 
since our presentation was rescheduled to January 10th, we had a little uh, we had a little time and the artist, they are the actual artist team, husband and wife, um, decided to make a small model of what um, the actual final project would look like. Um, because we believe that looking at a model is much more helpful to, you know, visualization process. Um, I'm going to give you a brief background about this project. Um, the sculpture will be created using approximately 3,000 various size metal, metal uh, letters. And then they will be arc welded to form the final sculpture that will be seven feet tall, approximately eight feet um, And then once it's completed, let me give you the, the, the process first. The sculpture will go through a sandblasting process. Then several layers of powder coat will be applied in sparkling ocean blue. This color was to honor the Santa Cruz community that wished to see more colorful, a colorful art in their environment. The finished sculpture will be seven feet tall by 7.8 feet wide, which includes the letters on the ground and 8.8 .8 feet deep. So this is gonna be a quite um, large uh, sculpture. The sculpture is depicted as a bent figure in the process of putting down on the ground inspirational words that describes the accumulated knowledge, information, aspirations, and ideas that every community seeks to realize. Communities are formed from small family units that ultimately contribute to the larger world communities. This sculpture letters shows us in words our potential to contribute to our community. This is one of the reasons this work needs to be part of the Live Oak Library Annex community so that the communities can come together at their local library. As you can see, um, I don't know if you have the map. Oh, there it's the map is on the screen. This will be located at the um, the drop off uh, drop off location um, and the entrance. But we, with safety and flow of traffic in mind, we believe this is the most appropriate location for the sculpture. And considerations. Um, this will be powder coated so that it will be um, pretty much impervious to the to the weather. Um, and so we, we felt like it was an important safety issue as well so that it's not sharp. Um, so, and that is the very brief introduction to the letter sculpture. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer. Thank you, Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair Friend. Thank you, Team Sobrante, and thank you to the uh, Parks, Open Space, and Cultural Services Department uh, for you know, undertaking this process again. Um, I think that, and I also want to thank Commissioner Paula Woods and Arthur Solway from the First District, who uh, volunteered and you know, really did some outreach to make sure we had as competitive as possible a group of applicants. Um, I, I think we had we did succeed in that. And um, there was a lot of really compelling proposals. Um, and there was, you know, it's a, a, a lot to choose from. So you guys have triumphed over, um, I mean, some, some other very great artists as well. Um, I know there is tension around, well, should we do something that celebrates the, the natural history and environment of the Live Oak environment, um, or something that celebrates what's going to happen in this uh, in this space? and uh, in the library annex itself. And uh, I, I think this vision is, is simple, but compelling and deeply moving. I, I feel that even more just seeing it in person here. Um, you know, I think every time I would be dropped off at the library, if I was a, a student studying or just going to find some quiet time, uh, be inspired by this statue. You, you said that uh, it's the figure is putting down letters. I, I also see that he's picking up letters, acquiring knowledge yes. um, as he goes into the library. Yes. And uh, I think it's, a, yeah, as I said, a simple but profound comment on how we are made up of the things that, uh, of the words that we've gathered over a lifetime. Definitely. So thank you. I think this will be a really wonderful addition to the Live Oak community. Thank you. 
Thank you, couldn't agree more. Uh, any other supervisors have comments before we open it up for the community? All right, we'd like to open it up for the community. Is there anybody in chambers that'd like to address us on this item? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, is there anybody online? Yes, we do have speakers online. Anne, your microphone is now available. Hi, my name is Anne Hazels and I'm with Radius Gallery. And I'm just um, speaking on behalf of my experience working with both David and Suja Choi. I had them in an exhibition um, just very recently, and I just want to speak to their professionalism and, you know, the reception to the community. Their work would be an absolute um, honor to have in our county. Their art is really a reflection of interconnectedness or the hope for it, which is so very perfect for the annex at the library here in our county. And I think this is a really powerful form of expression. It's the richest way to unite us. And I really look forward to seeing one of their sculptures here. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Thank you. Other speakers, Madam Clerk? Call in user two, your microphone is now available. Congratulations, and art is um, so vital to life. I think of this quote that, that it might have been Einstein or Schweitzer, the best refuge from the miseries of life are music and cats, but I think we could add art into it. So I'm glad to see that it's happening. Um, unfortunately, the libraries have so much Wi-Fi and antennas, I, I avoid going because it makes me feel quite sick from the radiation symptoms. But I'm glad to see art. And I want to take this opportunity to say you need to change the message when people call in because it states you will be muted throughout the meeting. It doesn't tell those phoning in, press star nine to raise your hand. Please change that. People are not able to speak to the board, which is their right because of this misinformation. Please put on there star nine to raise your hand so that you won't be muted throughout the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. You have no further speakers, Chair. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Stunning, stunning piece of, of artwork. Thank you Thank for you. submitting Thank you. that. I'll bring it back to the board for consideration. I'll enthusiastically move the recommended actions. We have a second. I'll second. We have a motion from Supervisor Koenig and a second from Supervisor Cummings. If we could please have a roll call, Madam Clerk. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Friend? Aye. Item passes unanimously. Congratulations. Now we'll move on to item 10, which is to consider the selection of Leah DeWitt as the public artist for the Aptos Library Project, approve an ag agreement with Leah for an amount not to exceed $106,000 and take related actions as outlined in the memo of the Director of Parks, Open Space and Cultural Services. We have the report, the, excuse me, we have the board memo, the artist proposal and the contract, please. Paula Woods again, uh, County Art Commissioner. The Arts Commission is pleased to recommend for your approval another outstanding artist proposal, the one for the Aptos Library. The artist previously approved for the Aptos Library public and art component asked that his contract with the county be terminated. Leah DeWitt was a finalist in the selection process and was interviewed by the panel who found her proposal to be highly high quality and appropriate for the Aptos Library. The Arts Commission reviewed her proposal at the November 7, 2022 meeting and voted to recommend your board approve her appro a proposal. I'd now like to introduce you to Leah DeWitt, who will give a brief presentation of her proposal and answer any questions you might have. And I'm not sure, is Leah here? 
Oh, she is here. Good. I didn't know if she was going to get down to the hill. Hi. Hi there. <laughs> Thank you, Paula. All the way from Boulder Creek. Right? All the way from Boulder Creek. It was adventurous, <laughs> say the least. I'm still a little rattled, I think. Um, thank you all for the time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Paula. Um, thank you, Jeff. Uh, so my name is Leah DeWitt, and I'm an artist living and working in Santa Cruz County, uh, as they said, in the suburbs of Boulder Creek. Um, uh, I'm thrilled to be presenting to you today my proposal um, for the Optos Library. Uh, it's a two-part proposal, um, and I believe the clerk is going to help me oh, advance. Oh, thank you. Okay, super. Great. Well, we'll see if I can handle this. Um, okay, so um, I'm proposing two series of steel and glass um, sculptural panels um, for this project. And uh, the, basically, I wanted to celebrate the natural beauty of the Aptos community. Um, it, it's, a, it's part of the design of the library. They're celebrating the Redwoods to the Sea, um, the nearby Monterey Bay um, in the design of the library. and um, so my my the two component components of my proposal um, celebrate both those natural assets of the um, of the area. And so here's the first uh, set of sculptural panels that would comprise um, the fence line on Soquel Drive and be adjacent to the uh, outdoor uh, teen area of the library. And here um, I I've, I've designed a, a, a an abstract wave design that would flow through the panels. It'd be uplifting, inspiring. And um, in the next slide, um, I, I'm sure I'd be dancing this. There we go. Um, in the next slide, I'm, I'm showing, what I'd like to do is reach out to the Advisory Council of Teens um, to work with um, reaching out to the uh, Aptos High School art students um, about soliciting them for ideas for additional elements to add to the panels. Here I've uh, suggested uh, kelp, um, Garibaldi's, anemones, uh, lively, bright, playful, whimsical, happy um, imagery that would flow beautifully with the abstract wave design. Um, and mm, let's see, next slide. Um, okay, this shows the location. Um, so this is along Soquel Drive, uh, right um, there in the outdoor area of the teen section of the library. Um, the seven continuous panels, or excuse me, the seven adjoining panels would be would, would comprise about 18 feet by um, 18, 18 feet long, six feet high. Um, and uh, I didn't say so made out of weathering steel, or aka core 10, so meant to go to rust, um, and with uh, kiln form glass panels. So uh, natural light will help those to glow and be more vibrant as the changing light throughout the day or with the changing light throughout the day. Um, okay, so the next section um, is the children's garden. I designed two sets of um, their panels with a central gate element on hinges. And um, with this, I, I tied in the portion of the library theme that is uh, the Redwoods, celebrating the Redwoods. So I designed... Um, little critters, flora and fauna from the Redwoods environment and um, banana slugs, mushrooms, um, excuse me, uh, the kind of redwood bark, uh, especially this time of year, how it gets greened up um, with the rain and have a nice flowing design, have it be inspiring and uplifting. Um, and there'd be two sections of the panels with the gates. They're approximately five feet wide, six feet high. And they would communicate each, with each other through that um, redwood bark element that would be flowing through the designs um, here, the redwood sorrel and ferns that you see in the redwood environment. And um, let's see, uh, this shows the uh, location, uh, having both sets of panels with gates flanking the children's area, the children's garden area, excuse me. Um, uh, that's pretty much it, the proposal. Um, I basically, I, I think that what I've proposed here works really well with not only the library design of the, you know, celebrating the natural environment of the Redwoods to the sea, um, but also, you know, uh, designs that really, I think, speak to a, a patrons of all ages, uh, from children to adults, um, captivating them with bright colors and, um, and, iconic imagery that's really meaningful to the Aptos environment. Um, 
And not only that, I think these designs integrate really well into the built environment, the design of the library. Um, and um, at any rate, um, thank you very much for your time. That's pretty much it. I, I would be honored to create this artwork for Aptos Library and um, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Do any of my colleagues have comments before I make comments? Supervisor Koenig. I, yeah, Leah, I just want to say I've seen your artwork throughout the community, uh, both at the new Kaiser facility downtown here, um, the Felton Library. Uh, it's really inspiring every time, um, particularly like the butterflies at the Felton Library. Um, and um, it's great that we're going to have an installation here that really displays such a breadth of your work. Um, and, and as you said, I mean, these look great on the screen, but I know they'll look, they look even better with the, the light shining through them and as you said they'll change a little bit throughout the day um so enthusiastically support this as well and, and we look forward to seeing it thank you appreciate thank you, supervisor that. koenig you made the mistake of saying you're a fifth district residence now we have to hear yeah. the prayer <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, yeah, no, if anybody who goes to the felton library they'll see how magnificent she did there too and it's just really nice that a touch of boulder creek is coming into aptos <laughs> <laughs> thank you um uh, any of my other colleagues you all right uh, let me just say, I, I had the, the, an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Damon, for a recent tour of the Aptos Library. It's going to be a, just a magical place, and this is only going to add to it. Um, my son uh, is very excited about the children's area, as you can imagine, and has been involved since the very beginning in the entire design idea. Every time we got a new design, I'd have to show it for his vetting, even though at the time he was seven and just turned eight. Mm -hmm. But he's going to love this. This is perfect. This is going to create the kind of memories exactly what we want for um, a once in a generation opportunity of a library remodel, but to also uplift not just local artists, but this reflection of our community in a way that your art does is a beautiful submission. We appreciate that you took the time to do it. Thank you very much. Is there anybody from the community that would like to address us on this item in chambers? Is there anybody online, Madam Clerk? Yes. <laughs> Call in user 2915. Your microphone is now available. You are unmuted. Thank you. This is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. I also had asked to speak on the other uh, previous item, but was not called. So I just submit some, submitted some written comment and, and mostly thanking Supervisor Koenig for his actions earlier that has led to a much better piece of art at Live Oak uh, Annex Library. So I am um, delighted to hear about this coming at the Aptos Library. I like that, especially that the artist is willing to um, reach out to the art students at Aptos High. I think that's marvelous and would also encourage her to contact the uh, junior high and maybe even the elementary schools to get them to become involved. That will pull them into this whole project and encourage them to come visit and make use of this wonderful new facility that's coming to our neighborhood. Um, I, uh, I just... Um, also, whenever I go to the Felton Library, I appreciate the art there. It's beautiful. And at the Live Oak Library, library uh, the, the access to the, the children's area that is, you're walking through a plexiglass uh, seaweed wall is marvelous and also very functional in terms of um, isolating the sound that can come from that area. So, um, Thank you. I support the arts, and I'm delighted that you're going to be the artist in lead in lead at this project. And again, thank you for involving local art uh, students and students interested in submitting their ideas for art at our library. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other speakers? We have no further speakers, Chair. Thank you. I'll bring it back to the board for consideration. Is there a motion? Recommended action. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor McPherson and a second from Supervisor Koenig. If we could please have a roll call. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Friend? Aye. Item passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.
We'll move on to the last item of the regular agenda before we go into closed session. That's item 11, which is to consider approval and concept of an uncodified ordinance reinstating the Board of Supervisors delegation of authority to the auditor, controller, treasurer, tax collector to invest funds in the county treasury and to schedule an uncodified ordinance for the second reading and final adoption on January 31st, 2023, as outlined in the memo by the auditor, controller, treasurer, tax collector. We have the board memo and the proposed ordinance, and we have a presentation from Mr. Scholar, Auditor Controller. Welcome, good morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Chair and board members, and welcome to our new supervisors. Uh, the item before you is an administrative one. It presents an uncodified ordinance to reinstate your board's formal annual delegation of authority to myself, the Auditor Controller, Treasurer Tax Collector. This delegation is to invest the funds held in your treasury pursuant to government code and specific sections of the Santa Cruz County Code. Due to an administrative oversight, this annual request was not made since 2020. I therefore request this be reinstated and an ordinance is attached to facilitate this. I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any board member questions on this item? Seeing none, is there anybody from the community and chambers that would like to address us? All right. Is there anybody online? Yes, Chair. We do have a speaker online. Call and user ending in 2915. Your microphone's now available. Hello, this is Becky Steinbruner. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, I remember that uh, supervisor, former Supervisor Coonerty once made um, a clarification to this um, code asking that there be some level of monitoring how the investments were made, more particularly to what causes or uh, uh, corporations they would support and making sure that those investments are in line with our county's uh, social and uh, environmental interests that we have all expressed. So I would like to respectfully ask that your board consider forming an ad hoc committee to again refresh those uh, filters if you will or parameters of how our county's money is invested and um, and reported back to your board and to the public on a regular basis thank you Ms. steinbrenner is there, are there any other all right, we'll close public comment and bring back to the board for action. I'll move the recommended actions and, and also just comment that we do have a treasury oversight committee, which I'm happy to serve as the board's representative on. Um, so certainly something that we can consider where those investments are being made at, at, with that committee. I'll second it. We have a motion from Supervisor Koenig and a second from Supervisor Hernandez. If we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And friend. All right. Item passes unanimously. Thank you. The, we'll, the board will move into closed session. Is there anything anticipated to be reportable at a closed session? Not today. All right. Our next regular agenda will be on January 31st at 9 a.m. That will close the regular meeting. <laughs> so is there